everybody. Thank you very much. Um, so you are live from KDH, uh, Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. Uh, my name is Martin Mampers. I'm, I'm professor of software technology here, and I'm running this DevOps course at KDH. Uh, this is the first edition of this course. And it's uh, the last uh, lecture of this, uh, of this course. And today we have outstanding guest lecturers uh, coming from uh, Stockholm here, coming from Electronic Arts. Uh, and, uh, and we are very happy to have, to have them here. So first, a round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> so this is Mark Baker. Uh, David King, uh, technical directors at uh, at EA uh, here in the in the Dice Studio in, in Stockholm, and they will be talking today about about uh, massive scale uh, quality assurance for multiplayer video games. Uh, there will be an open um, question session after the talk, so feel free to add comments on uh, on, on on YouTube directly. Uh, you'll be able, we'll be able to read them uh, and to read aloud so that you can you can answer them. And also for for, for you who are here in real life, uh, also feel free to ask questions at the end of the talk. Uh, Mark, David, thank you very much uh, for coming today at KDH for contributing to this DevOps course, uh, and we are we all look uh, forward to to your talk. Thank you. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, yep. Thank you, Martin. Cool, yeah, so uh, as you said, um, I'm Mark and this is Dave, and uh, what are you doing, Dave? <laughs> Always QAing things, we can't stop him. Uh, so uh, yeah, we're from Electronic Arts Dice, and uh, in case you didn't know uh, what that company does, uh, we've just got a, a quick video to show you at the start. So you can see uh, why we love being in video games, um, because you get to make incredible things like that. Um, and we're part of the, the teams that help the, the folks who are making that do so more efficiently. Um, I'm from the DRE team. David's from the QV engineering. QV engineering team. Uh, that won't mean it. That's totally fine. Uh, to make it simple, uh, I'm from the build guys. And I'm from the test guys. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about today is the thing that we care about the most uh, within EA, which is this, uh, this green arrow here, uh, which is the process of getting work from creators' machines out into the hands of players. Um, for us, stuff's only real when people can actually play it and experience it. Um, and a stat that we talk about a lot internally is this metric of time to player. And it's how long, obviously, after I've, I've made my masterwork on my computer and I want to show it to someone, how long does it take to get that into the hands of an actual player? Uh, and in a traditional kind of waterfall box product model, we spend around about four years making a game and then we put it onto Blu-rays and we put it on shelves and people buy it. And so the average time is about two years. So that's quite long. That's not really the world that we want to live in or the world that we're living in now in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Uh, you all have noticed, of course, that lots of games are very much what we call live service. Updates are coming out all the time. And so really we're looking at taking a fairly complex process that used to take kind of two years on average. And really we want to reduce that down to about two weeks. So that's fairly big couple of orders of magnitude change. Uh, and uh, that's, that's where we come in is trying to make that process faster and better for the studios. Um, now, there's some unique things about games. Obviously, the, the fun output, I think, is quite a nice, uh, unique thing. But there's some, some downsides as well. And we're going to talk a little bit, before we go into more details of what's in this green arrow, we're going to set the stage for what does it mean to be trying to do this for games. Uh, and there's two uh, big components to this being difficult. And the first is, is scale. And the second is the complexity of the thing that we're trying to do. 
Uh, so let's look at the, the scale briefly. Um, in case you weren't already aware of how big games are, um, if I was trying to just get the latest version of, say, Battlefield 5 onto my machine to start building that, I'd need to uh, use about 500 gig of my disk just to get one version. That's not the history of everything. That's just the latest version. And a lot of that data has already been exported. So the, the total repository size, we're talking in the multiple terabytes here. So it's pretty big. Uh, and then I need a, a pretty big machine to actually um, process this stuff in like a reasonable amount of time. So we're talking very many multi-core GPUs. Uh, it's at least eight, typically. It's often sort of in the, the 30s or 40s under people's desks. Uh, but in the build farms, it's at least eight. Uh, as much RAM as we can get in them. And they certainly need kind of a, a terabyte at least of working set. And, and quite often, it's a bit bigger. It's not uncommon for that to be kind of double that size. So, so fairly big. And then the actual artifacts that we're making at the end is basically a, a dual layer Blu-ray. So it's about 50 gig. And honestly, we, we struggle to fit them onto a Blu-ray just to get out the door before we start shipping lots of patches. Um, so these are pretty big things to then be copying around and uh, uh, distributing. We'll talk a bit about that challenge later. Um, so that's one metric of scale. Uh, the other metric that I want to talk about is how big the teams are, because ultimately this is about working with people. And a, sort of the smallest team that you would get making a AAA game these days is around about 300 people. And when it gets to a really big, um, quick, we've got to get, get it finished, get as much in there, and get it out the door on time, we're often working with other teams around the world. So um, Star Wars Battlefront 2, we were up to about 1,000 developers at, at peak on that. Uh, and the extra complexity of adding those developers is that they aren't in the same place as you. They're, around, they're somewhere else around the world, and very typically on another continent. So then you've got the challenge of doing all this scale also then across different time zones and where the speed of light isn't your friend because just pushing that data around takes a long time. Um, and because we're trying to do this as quickly as possible, we also throw a bunch of CPUs at it. So we're, we're talking around about 600 to 1,200 um, virtual machines in, an, in our build farm, and that is per game. So as you can imagine, EA has quite a lot of uh, CPUs working on this problem most of the time. So that's an idea of, of how big and how difficult the, the technical side is. Um, but the actual game them, games themselves um, are not simple either. Um, we're trying to, to make these games as good as we can. And so we're trying to use all of the power that we can from these different systems. And we, we're doing so on a pretty big code base. It's multiple millions of lines of code. And it's all generally in the one repository. So the big repository. Um, the code itself is multi-threaded, it's multi-platform, uh, and that adds to the complexity. Uh, and as you know, if you play games these days, most of them are based on physics engines. And the fun thing for QA about those is you never quite get the same thing happen twice. And then you get kind of hilarious bugs where things ping off and fly off into space and go through walls and stuff like that. So, you know, that's, uh, that's some extra fun that we, we have to deal with. Um, but the more philosophically hard problem is games aren't spreadsheets. It's not just a question of does this functionally do do what it says on the the, the unit test spec. You can't write a unit test for fun, um, and so you know that is in itself a challenge. Even when we've done all of like the code quality things, and we know yes, it does. All these systems in the game mechanically do what they're supposed to do. Is it actually any fun to play? Because that's actually the point. Uh, and so what we've found over the years is the way to try and make your game more fun is to really go around this iteration cycle more often. Um, so a lot of why we throw so many uh, bits of hardware at these uh, problems is because we want to shorten this time, not just the time to player, but the, the time to studio. How quickly can we make a change and then have lots of people play it in the studio? Because we know the faster we go around this cycle, the more tweaks we can make. And making really excellent games is all about tweaking and polishing and tweaking and iterating. So it's making that iteration as quick as possible is a big focus for us. So that's, uh, that's the, the scene that we're, we're trying to, to work in. Um, what we're going to do is look at uh, this continuous delivery pipeline for AAA games. And at the very top level, 
it doesn't look that different from other kind of software delivery pipelines. There's a build stage, there's some testing, and there's some deployment. Um, but let's add some complexity in there. Um, we've got lots of different types of builds that we do, uh, and I'll go into these in, in more details later. We've got lots and lots of different types of tests that David's going to be talking about later on. Uh, and then we don't just deploy once or into one environment or even into two environments. We deliver into a ton of different environments to different audiences and for different reasons. So there's even the deploy stage is a little bit complicated. Um, so what we're going to do uh, over the rest of this talk is we're going to look at the journey of a game from the developer's computer into the hands of a player. Uh, and we're going to use this uh, little bar across the bottom to kind of show you where in the, the journey we're talking about. Uh, and basically, I'm going to talk for uh, another 15 minutes or so about the build side of things, and then a bit about the deploy side of things. And we'll have a quick break, and then David's going to come back and talk in more detail about the testing side of things. So let's look at uh, the build side of things, get a bit more detail into that. Um, and uh, there's a thing that we do in games which is relatively uncommon in continuous integration generally. Uh, and it's a thing that uh, we've got lots of different names for. I've put pre-flight on here. Um, but I'll explain what the, what the use case is first and then talk more about it. So let's say I'm Bob. I've written an amazing new bit of code. Um, it's great. It's some new UI, probably, because it looks like JavaScript, I think. Uh, and uh, I want to share it with my team so they can all see how amazing it is. So I'm going to commit it into the repository. Uh, obviously, our CI is going to then build that. And oh, no, I've, I've broken the build. And uh, my team is now super unhappy with me because uh, the, the code that's in the repository doesn't build anymore. So if anyone gets that, uh, suddenly they can't build anymore. They can't do anything locally. And uh, this is a big problem when you have these much larger teams. The cost of breaking the main dev line becomes really high when you have you know, 800 people working off of that. So you really don't want to do that. And even if the key thing is, even if your cycle time on, on testing that is really short, even if it only takes you two or three minutes to do that build, the trouble is there's 800 people working in here. Another five or six changes might have landed in in that time. So when a build's broken, it's not necessarily clear which check-in has broken it. So it always takes a while to unpick that. And essentially, the more people that pile onto one branch, just the more likely it is you're going to get into this state and people are going to get blocked. And, and then producers get unhappy because deadlines start getting missed. And, and it's all bad. So basically, how do we solve this problem? Uh, and the answer is we, we have a pre-flight bouncer uh, who sits in front of this uh, commit process uh, and makes sure that it's good. Uh, and what that looks like technically is uh, we have a, a tool that people run on their um, workstations, and that uh, then takes their change in isolation, uh, puts it into our build farm, and that uh, change is tested against the latest known good version of the, the code or all the data that we've got. Uh, and it does a, a subset of the tests that we do in the main CI, uh, because we also want to try and do this as quickly as possible, because otherwise someone's literally sat there tapping their fingers going, come on, I need to, I need to, this, I need to get this in. Um, and so we, we try and catch about 90, 95% of the, the potential breakages. And that really helps get this balance between moving quickly and moving quickly together, um, because it's a, it's a team effort making a game because they're so big, and we've really got to protect that team. Uh, and so pre-fight is a weird one because it sits slightly before where most CI things start, because they start off with, oh, you get a commit, and then all this other stuff happens. And this is more, well, no, hold off on that commit there, buddy. We've got to make sure that this is good before we even start doing all this other stuff. So let's, ass let's assume that Bob's change is good. It gets through the pre-flight bouncer, uh, and now it's going to go into the main CI, and we're going to do something. So let's look a bit at the, the complexity of, of what we do in that CI. Um, well, um, we have multiple clients, multiple games uh, systems that we're targeting. Uh, and we're going to talk mainly about multiplayer games. So we have a typically a client-server situation here. Uh, and EA has its own uh, game engine. Um, so as part of that, we have our own um, data build pipeline. And so it's quite common that we actually need to, to build the tools that are then going to build that data. I'll talk more about data in a minute. But for now, let's assume we, we build some tools. Uh, and then we take those tools 
and we've then got to build all of the data and it's really common for that to actually vary per platform as well so we've got lots of different uh, build processes going on for each platform uh, so then we've got some code and we've got some data and to have a running game we've got to have both of those put together so we'll have a process that bundles bundles these two things together into something that you can actually run and play uh, and that's pretty good that we're almost done um, but if we're if we're wanting to, to push this out in an efficient manner, remember we're, we're talking about 50 gig or so of data now, uh, we also want to then have a patch process that takes uh, the previous output and this new output and tries to do a bit of smart deltering around it. And that's where we try and get the size that we ship out to people as small as possible. So this is a simplified diagram. <laughs> And as you can see, it's already pretty complicated. Um, I've just picked three platforms. It's quite common that each of those platforms would actually have different variations that you'd have like a debug and a release and a retail configuration. So it's, it's pretty common for us to be maybe building a dozen different versions of the game uh, from any one commit. Um, so you can see how that sort of three line change suddenly turns into gigabytes and gigabytes of data. Um, so let's look a little bit into data builds, as I keep saying this word data and I haven't really talked about it. Um, games are kind of also weird because of the amount of data that we have. It's not just about the code, although the code is obviously where all the interactivity comes from and where the complexity and the behavior comes from. There's still an enormous amount of content that we have in games. Uh, and when you look at it by size of what's going on the disk, actually the content is the vast majority don't tell the programmers, um, but the, the artists actually contribute most of the stuff that goes onto the disk. Uh, and so to get through all of that stuff as quickly as possible, um, like I say, we've got our own uh, set of tools. And um, because again, this is so big, we want to do it quickly. Um, we can throw as many cores as we like at that. And so we typically do. But even doing that, if we were going to start from scratch and build 500 gig of data, even on a very multi-core machine, you're, that's going to take a few hours. And you really don't want people sat there waiting for a machine to do something. That's not a very good use of their time. Um, so you're, if you're a programmer, you're probably sat there thinking, well, can't they just cache this? Well, yes, of course we do. So we have a, we have a cache that's shared that's on a network. And if you're lucky, if you're only changing, say, one texture, then good news, we're going to have a really good hit rate on that cache. And most of that data is just going to come out of the cache. Uh, if you're unlucky and maybe you've changed a, a shader definition, then it's still going to take a while because you're going to have to rebuild all of the meshes. Uh, and that, uh, that would still take uh, a good hour or two. Um, so that was, that was pretty good. This is actually what we've had for quite a long time. And that gets everyone reasonably um, productive. Um, but after a while, we, we noticed, well, this network cache hit rate is so good. We're copying around a lot of this 500 gig to everyone's machine. And then we're not reading it. So that just seems wasteful. Why, why don't we not do that? Uh, so we've recently started to do that. We've, we've hooked up our process that syncs data out of the repository to basically the, the build system itself. And that, uh, instead of just syncing everything, whether you need it or not, uh, it waits until it knows that you need that data to pull it down. Uh, and that's, that's good. That's got our data size down by around about 40%. Um, so that's good, but we don't really want to stop there. Um, I said that making games is a team effort. And it's actually really common that you get teams working on a particular, say, area of the world, if they're an art team, or a particular feature, if, if they're a feature team. And so what, we, what we're looking at at the moment is building a, a shared database. So instead of building on one person's machine, we're essentially building this shared chunk of the world that everyone can then using their editor or run their game against at the same time. And as you can imagine, that's a kind of multi-user database. So suddenly, it's a lot more complexity around, or you can't all just change it whenever you like. We've got to do some locking and things like that. There's a bit more complexity in there. But we think that that um, will give us better teamwork. So that's all I'm going to say about building things. But uh, as I said, when we're when we're building stuff, that's great. But then, the, then we've got to do something with these assets. We've got to get them to places. So let's talk about that for a bit. And this uh, covers, as you can see from the bottom, this covers both kind of the end of the build process, but also some of this stuff is about our final deploy as well. We use some of the same tech. 
Um, so we've got a build process that we were just talking about. And um, all of the arrows in that build process were, were binary uh, artifacts as a result of that build process. So unsurprisingly, we tend to store those on uh, local uh, network shares in the studio. Uh, and then when we've, uh, when we've got something that we can actually execute and do things with, we, we chuck a little reference in a database so we can quickly find this stuff again. Uh, and then if you're, if you're Bob and you want to see oh, how does, my, how does my, my change look on all these different platforms, um, you can then have a, a tool on your machine that will go and look up um, where, uh, where this, this change that you've put and you've got you know, a, a commit reference. Um, you can go and say, well, have, is that built yet? Great, okay, I'll go and download it onto my machine. Uh, and you just do that using um, file copies locally. So that's, that's all fine for if you're in the same studio that the build is happening in. But uh, we were saying before, it's quite common that you aren't, that you might be working on someone else's game. And so um, we've got a, uh, an EA internal global build service um, that we'll, we'll publish a subset of our artifacts to. We don't do it for every single change because that would just be way too much data. Um, but we'll do it quite often. And um, the build service does a, a number of different things. Um, but its main thing is to try and make the deployments as quickly as quick as possible out to people around the world. Um, so it's quite a common use case that you have, say, um, a big QA team in Romania, as we do, and you want uh, 50 people to test the latest build of, say, FIFA uh, on 9 a.m. Monday morning. Uh, and so this, what you can do in this system is you set up a subscription um, that knows, okay, I need to. I need to start delivering this by, by this time. And it will grab the, the latest good version and uh, do some efficient copying. Um, because again, we're quite often copying out to many people at the same time. So rather than each of them downloading separately, uh, we have this sort of local caching system that, uh, that delivers it within the studio first and then locally from there delivers it out to all of the different users. And uh, we do some, the nice thing about this system actually is it's a, uh, a central team uh, within EA that maintains this. And it's very API driven. And it's a good example of using APIs um, and then improving the implementation under the hood. And a number of different times, they've swapped out the implementations uh, to something that's better. Uh, and we don't need to care about it as users. It just gets faster. And recently, we've had some improvements with uh, the way the networking works within a local studio. So that if you are delivering out to 50 people, it's uh, much, much faster than it used to be to, to push that out, because that's quite a common use case that we have. Um, so yeah, so we basically make use of this global service um, to push stuff around the world in an efficient way. So I'm going to talk a bit now about, that's kind of how we push things out, but I'm going to talk about where we push things out to. Uh, so the, the simple case is the one that I've talked a bit about already, that if you're a local developer, or if you're in QA or doing local play tests, uh, you just want to, to deploy it onto your local kit. Uh, and actually, play tests, I want to call out as being a really important thing, because that's a Im really important part of that iteration cycle, especially with multiplayer games. You can't really do a proper play test with just you. Um, you need to have a bunch of different people. So uh, in DICE, um, it's pretty much an hour every day that we'll have some new level or feature being tested and we're trying to get you know full 64 player um, servers uh, every day if we can uh, and so trying to get everyone onto the right version uh, is, is quite a quite a challenge in and of itself so we have tools that make sure everyone uh, is syncing the right thing but playtests are really important to, to quality um, so that's in your local studio um, I said before we've got the the global development. Um, we have global QA. We also have um, global outsourcers as well. Some of those thousand developers won't necessarily even be people that work for EA directly. Some of them will be from content outsourcing companies. Um, and uh, so we will need to push builds out to them um, because they often uh, aren't allowed to build the game locally. Um, so we'll, we'll push um, some kind of subset of the game out to them. And we'll quite often push the, the actual development tools as well, because as well as just the, the build pipeline, we also build a lot of like the editor tools. 
that uh, that come with the game. Typically, games sort of bootstrap their whole environments during the, the game development process, and it's super common for us to build our own authoring tools before we then actually author the content with them later. So we'll often be pushing tools out um, to them, and again, that's using the, the global um, platform. In fact, one thing I forgot to say about the global platform is um, some of the stuff that it knows about is how to push to different consoles uh, and even to phones. So it's not just a kind of intelligent file copier, although that's a big part of it. It also knows how to deliver content directly onto um, you know, your Playstations or Xboxes or, or what have you. So you can literally go into the, the web page for it and say, yes, uh, please, here is the name of these 20 um, kits. I want you to push this build onto these 20 kits and, and do it now, please. So that's super useful. It's, it really reduces the complexity of managing these big QA teams. Uh, so the other uh, global use that we have is, is we'll periodically run global playtests. Uh, and if you if you work for, for EA, this is where you get a chance to play someone else's game because you play your game all the time. But then you get to to play someone else's game in a big global playtest. And uh, uh, so we use again the same global delivery system for that. Um, but now we're going to start to get a bit closer to the actual players, and we're deploying out into our production systems. Uh, and the thing that we've started to do more recently, which I love, is that we often have community test environments. Uh, and that allows us to use um, all of the production systems um, and get real players actually playing the game and people who you know, haven't played it every day for the last year, so they may be a bit more objective. They can tell us what they really think. Um, we'll push that out, and uh, that's generally using the production server infrastructure as well. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, for some platforms, it's just the server that we're allowed to change. For other platforms, we can push out a client update as well. Um, and um, the, a little bit about the server deploys is basically when we are running servers in production, we're basically running them as, as Linux servers. That's the, the most common um, uh, deployment platform that we see. And that is a combination, depending on the game, of both um, sort of traditional virtualized servers, uh, hardware servers, and containerized servers these days. So, so we're, we're using, again, we've got a, uh, an IT operations team um, who use all of the sort of normal Linux deployment techniques you would think of uh, to push out to those. Uh, and then lastly, of course, most importantly, we have our production release. And um, uh, I was watching at the weekend the, um, the feature length uh, um, documentary about making the recent God of War game. And at the very end, they build a gold master disc and send it off. And they're super excited for this disc. And I sat there going, oh, that's interesting. They still build discs. Because uh, we don't, <laughs> we don't build discs anymore. We the uh, the global um, system that we've got will also handle delivering it in, into the uh, the partners that we have. So it will do the uh, if it's a, a sort of third party platform, it will deliver it directly into their submission process. Um, I'm assuming without burning discs, although again, if it does, we don't need to see them. So from my point of view, it doesn't exist. Um, but it's certainly if we're releasing to Origin, which is our own PC system, then it, it's plugged directly into our content distribution network there. So we can literally um, have the release button be pressed in that and uh, that will then go live shortly. So let me just wrap up the kind of build and deploy side of things and also tie it a bit back into DevOps. Uh, and talk about, and I'm sure you've seen that about a million times by now, it's the classic DevOps uh, loop. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about how, how um, games are going from this waterfall model, this box product on a shelf um, way of selling things that I talked about, and more into a live service. Uh, and games, multiplayer games have always been about community, right? That's, that's how we make multiplayer games last a long time and how they're fun. You need to have other people to play against, so community has always been important for that. But now that we've got you know these live service updates coming out all the time, we've got a real opportunity for the game team to closely connect with that community and monitor not just sort of technically how the game is performing, um, but also what the community sentiment is like and have that feedback in, in terms of the, the monitor part of this. It's not just technical, it's the, the community sentiment feeding that into what players like or don't like, what can we change and improve. And so we've actually restructured how some of our game teams do their, 
their project planning even, which is like, sh stop talking about that market, it's super boring, but actually it's kind of interesting that they're, they're now using what we call a seven-week heartbeat process. And that uh, comprises of three two-week sprints and then a week of planning and also some, some hack days for people to try out crazy new things. And how that relates to releases is quite commonly that one week at the end is where we'll have a really big content release. And there'll be then a smaller release at the end of each of those two weeks. And maybe it's just a hot fix or a server update or something like that. But if you see you know, Battlefield or other things coming out with releases with this kind of cadence, now you know why. It's because the DICE team is working like that. We find that gives us a really good balance of every seven weeks sort of stopping and going, which direction do we want to go in next? How is that player feedback seeming? What's the, the plan for that going forward? But then we have these smaller two-week, very sort of classic agile things that we're delivering something every two weeks. And we can actually still get updates into players' hands. And again, at the moment, that's kind of mainly your classical, oh, we, we really need to fix that bug. So like, let's do that in two weeks, get that out to the players. Again, give them an improved um, experience with the game. So the direction that we're heading as well with these big games is we're actually splitting that into smaller teams. And we're starting to see those smaller teams can release their bit of the game independently, uh, as we've seen with, with Battlefield Five having its um, Firestorm uh, release a while back. That was an independent team that was making that game mode. Uh, and from my perspective as a guy that, that provides CI to game teams, we're actually seeing these smaller game teams getting more self-sufficient. And so we're more interested in giving them things like CI as a service. So they can just check a configuration file in and control this incredibly complicated progress process I've been talking about uh, through just some simple config rather than them having to you know, open a JIRA ticket or, or wander over to my desk and ask me something. Uh, and my thesis is that game teams are becoming DevOps because they're becoming these, um, these teams that can manage all of the process themselves from what they make right out through the build and into the, the production process and then manage that and, and go through the whole cycle again. And as we want to you know, move quickly, I love being saying quick and fast a lot of this talk, and we know that one of the ways to do that is to do it with smaller teams. Smaller teams are always faster than big teams. And so the challenge is how we do that at the kind of scale that EA is. So that's the end of my section. Uh, we'll take a quick five minute break and then uh, David will come back and talk to you about test automation. So thanks very much and I'll be back for questions at the end.
That was a uh, very short five minutes, but uh, thank you very much. We've got a lot to talk about, and I hope you uh, found it interesting so far. Thank you very much for Mark for setting the stage uh, for me. And uh, hello, everyone. My name's uh, David King. I've been working with EA for about 11 years now, and I just want to kind of share with you a story about when I started at EA. Uh, which I think is a little bit of a metaphor like this, a lone person looking up a, an unassailable monolith. So when I started on my very first day back in 2008, um, I was taken into the building, I was sat down in front of a copy of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, and I was said, automate Harry walking around the castle so we can test the navigation. It's just absolutely crazy like scope for just a completely new and fresh engineer to actually have a, have a look at, and I think Really, what I, if I was to summarize like my last 11 years of what I've been doing and what we need to do now, it's about reducing the complexity set, not seeing that absolutely massive monolith, the behemoth coming out of the clouds that you alone have to test and you alone have to see you know, whether it's actually going to work. It's reducing it down into manageable chunks so that we can actually achieve that time to play. We can re achieve that fast and high quality turnaround uh, because really, Games are like this, especially if you're coming into it fresh, and they get bigger and b badder every day. I've had 10 years of getting used to this. I can't imagine what uh, new starters now would be feeling. And what Mark was saying earlier is absolutely true. Games are massively, massively complex systems, and they're only ever getting bigger. So this, for example, is a diagram of the back-end systems for Star Wars Battlefront 2. Um, every single one of these boxes, I've blanked out the names for uh, privacy reasons, every single one of these boxes is an individual system, it's an individual component that makes up the ecosystem of the massively multiplayer games that we do today. This tiny little controller here, that is just the game client, that's what you download onto your machines, onto your consoles to play. This box here is the game server. Everything else is a component of the back end, something which has its own job, has its own thing, something that contributes to the entire system. This box, for example, I can't remember what most of them do, this could be the matchmaking system, the marketplace system, the thing that's tracking your statistics or anything else. It's, uh, it's absolutely huge. And even, even just that client, even that small pit, it's a very, very complex piece of software. Millions of lines of code, 200 plus modules for an individual project contributing together for this. So you've got your physics, you've got your, um, you know, your standard libraries, your, uh, you know, your engine thing, the data interpreters, the graphics libraries, many, many graphics libraries uh, all working together. Um, and as Mark said, again, over 95%, and in fact, in some releases, 99% of all of the stuff that we will deliver to users is data, it's content, it's uh, not anything to the executable. The executable will interpret it and you turn that into the experience that you enjoy, but a lot of the logic isn't in code, a lot of it you can't test. And yeah, the feature set is massive and the feature set is also rapidly, rapidly changing. And you know, just to give you an idea of just how complex it is or how much testing is required, I'd just like to ask you, just think. Now if I, as a developer, or I need to test for just one hour all of the maps and um, every single game mode on every single map for Battlefield 5. How many hours or how many man effort hours do you think that will take? Um, the answer is 2,304. 2,304 hours just to test each game mode for one hour because it's massively multiplayer. Most of them have either got 64 or 32 players that you have to do. That immediately takes this beyond anything that realistically humans can do without throwing like just basically warehouses and warehouses full of people at the problem which is not something we want to do. We need to, uh, we need to reduce the complexity set there. Um, and actually, this is just a small thing of it. So when you actually uh, run like a full test case or a full uh, screen to squips, we will typically run between 2,000 to 10,000 uh, hours worth of testing, or I mean, just automated testing uh, on uh, any single patch that we give out, depending on the size, the complexity, and the amount of features that we have. But also, again, it doesn't really matter how much, well, it does matter how much testing we do, but it just absolutely pales in comparison to what actually happens when we finally release, when we finally get to that player. Uh, so typical software will have a user curve that just ramps on gradually over time. Games are not like that. Games will have an absolutely massive spike of users at the beginning, which will then tail off over time. And in fact, the amount of people who play our game is so large that we will typically outdo the entire amount of runtime that we've had in the game for the entire project life cycle in the first two hours of launch. So think about that. Think about that from a testing perspective. So if you've got, um, if you've got a, like a really rare, really edge case bug that you only see one in a thousand times, chances are it's going to be seen thousands and not tens of thousands of times 
once the players get out there. So ensuring a high quality or a high tested release is absolutely critical. So again, testing all that is unscalable, unsustainable, and it doesn't help with getting our games out fast. So how do we tackle this? Well, primary thing, automated testing. Uh, so we have uh, spent a, a large amount of time, and at least my team has spent some time, uh, creating or at least modifying our game engine so that we can actually script uh, the test cases within the game data. So um, all of you are familiar, and uh, probably some of the viewers are going to be familiar with uni unit tests. Uh, you know, isolating systems and isolating the individual components and just making sure that with data input and data output, it works fine. And while you can do that with some of the code, remember, 95% or more is data and you can't unit test that because it all, or at least the vast majority of it, relies on the entire stack being up and running. So we have a huge amount of uh, test cases which actually you know, require us to be basically running the game. Now this slows them down a lot, which means that we need to be intelligent about what we do and we need to have those test cases alongside it. So what we did was we modified the engine and you can see up in the top right corner there um, as an example of the uh, visual uh, scripting language which our data uses uh, to just uh, do a typical logic f uh, logical flow. And then that means that uh, the, the, uh, the developers and content creators can create their test cases whilst they're also creating the features of the game. It also means the QA, um, because this is not an engineering system, so this is not a coding system, this is just a visual scripting language, QA can, also use the, uh, QA can also use the technology to actually start automating their test cases, which again is allowing us to speed up and allowing us to reduce the complexity set. Now, the video here, which is uh, not playing anymore, but that was uh, an example of uh, an automated test that was done for the single-player campaign for Battlefield 1. And what happened was that was actually written by the developers. So as they were creating and as they were updating the uh, single-player campaign, they'd also, be, uh, they'd also be scripting a playthrough of it so that we could run a playthrough on every single platform every single day to just make sure that the actual core gameplay and the core flow of that works. Then you've immediately saved uh, three people every single day because you can do that in an automated fashion and also because um, in the same way as unit tests because this data and because the testing data is in the same location as the game's data you don't have a horrible situation which we used to have where uh, QA or someone like myself would uh, script a playthrough the developers would change it and it would suddenly break it now the developers own it and it's there they can see when they're going to be breaking things so these things stay green now as you saw before, we have a large amount of game modes, we have a large amount of tests, and there's a huge amount of features, all the guns, all the weapons, all the vehicles, and everything else that we need to test. And you know, if you need the full stack up, if you can't uncap the frame rate because you'll have determinis determinis determinism issues with some of the back ends or some of the physics system, you need a lot of hardware to run this on. You think, man, you must need hundreds of consoles to run that. And you would be right, we do. <laughs> Uh, so this is a picture of the automated test farm that we have uh, in DICE in Stockholm. And if any of you ever have the opportunity to visit there, please hit me up. I would love to show you around here. Um, this room has actually grown in size. It's now twice the size it was when I took this picture, which was about a year ago. Um, it is currently shared by both DICE and Frostbite. And it has, I think, about two to 300 of each of the uh, Xboxes and Playstations and PCs uh, on it that are continuously running the vast amount of suites of tests that we have. And uh, yeah, just making sure that we can catch those issues, those build breaks, that big siren that got through the pre-flight uh, bouncer uh, as quickly as we can so that they can be actioned and we can make sure that mainline stays in a good state for everyone. And I mean, it doesn't have to be as part of the build process. There'll, there's many different stages um, along the uh, development process where we'll be running tests. We might have it as part of pre-flight. We might have it as part of the build system. We might have it as part of uh, a regular development process, deciding whether to push all of the changes up to a, mo uh, a more master branch. We may also be doing soak tests overnight to catch uh, the longer and the more nasty bugs. Because you know, in a large scale multiplayer game, most of the worst bugs we'll only ever see after several hours of max player testing which again is something that humans cannot do. But now that we have this bandwidth, now that we have this, that means we can find these things a lot easier and a lot more scalable than we used to. You also don't have to be a AAA studio and you don't have to have the sort of budget to get this to be able to achieve these things. Even if you have maybe one or two consoles, uh, you know, something which you would be able to put aside for your project, the amount of value you can get from just investing time in this system is just fantastic because Let's think, these can run overnight. These don't need to have humans here. You, or if you've got your tests fast enough, you can you know, start your test running, go and get a coffee, come back and check whether it's been good or not. Again, reducing the complexity set and making the best use of your time that you have. But beyond testing, I mean, we could still just test everything, but I think some, one of my team calculated if we actually wanted to write and run a test for absolutely everything, it would cost in the order of probably about uh, 10,000 hours. 
So we try and reduce the complexities out of that. Or we try and use automation for more interesting things, like, for example, performance testing. So this is going, uh, this is going a little bit beyond just like running the test, but it's also automatically collecting the data that we need to be able to uh, get the most value out of these tests. There's no point running, let's just say, a 24-hour 64-player uh, multiplayer session if all you're checking is that doesn't crash. You can also catch loads of other information that you're interested in. Uh, this is an example of a map from Battlefield 1, which we're using to collect performance data from the game. Uh, in this particular thing, it's the amount of draw calls that were had on uh, each uh, section of the map. And we managed to get this information just by running playtests and just by running automated playtests. So we're getting more value out of the time um, that we have been running. This also allowed, and this data was completely open, this allowed uh, content creators to focus on the areas where there, was, uh, red, um, where there were red calls so they could optimize it and we shouldn't be losing frame rate drops. All of this stuff was also, um, I don't know if you can see on the right there, it was captured and shown in graphs, which were shown over time, which were then correlated against time and change lists. So you could see when a change came in that maybe uh, caused the, uh, the draw calls to spike or the, uh, the frame rate to go down. So you can identify and eliminate these changes. Again, if you've got 800 people working on a code branch, you need to identify and remove defects as quickly as you can. But again, um, but again let's... Uh, how do we test things without humans? And the answer to that is uh, typically AI. So not all of our games have AI, but what we did, or what my, uh, some of my colleagues did, is they uh, invested some time creating a classical AI system. It's a very, very simple um, classic AI system, just a state graph. But just like the automated testing system built into the data, it uses those data systems. It fits into everyone's individual workflows. Um, and then all you need to do is just be able to script basic AI behavior, or uh, maybe highlight an area of the map, say generate a navigation mesh here, and then that capability is there. Um, the system which uh, those engineers developed was actually so useful um, that content creators have actually started using that system to prototype some of their game modes, uh, because you know, it's still <laughs> easier than the corralling 32 people together, even in a studio as large as DICE. And it actually became so useful that um, these AI players, even though they were just purely made for testing, actually made it into a release feature in Star Wars Battlefront 2 a couple of months ago. So if any of you have been playing the new uh, Titan mode, your AI companions, they're built out of this AI system because it was just so quick and easy to use and it allowed us to test a huge amount of it. Um, we can also do really cool things like we can uh, create thin clients. So that's uh, just a regular client but without the graphics layer on it so that we can run quite a lot of them on VM servers. Uh, Right, creating loads of them along using the AI means that we can do a large-scale um, stability testing. We can spin up tens of thousands of clients to be testing the back-end systems, you know, that massive web that I showed you earlier. We can just create 10,000 thin clients and just have AI hooked up onto them to just simulate real human behavior. You remember I told you earlier that, you know, two hours after launch, there would have been more hours played by our players? Well, going wide with that in thin clients is a great way of trying to tackle that. Uh, now, there's actually an excellent, talk on, uh, there's an excellent talk on the AI players and the workflows that they've enabled in the GDC vault um, by uh, my colleague, uh, Jonas Gilberry. Uh, it's called AI Testing, uh, the Development of Bots to Play Battlefield 5. If you have access to the GDC vault, I highly recommend uh, that you uh, see it. So that's kind of like a high level sum of the things we do for testing. I mean, it really was a, a whirlwind tour. But despite the fact, you know, you've just got this test thing in the middle, testing goes at every single every single phase. I mean, if, you know, remember Mark said earlier, we have pre-flight, you'd have a testing bubble here, we've probably got testing bubbles in here, here, here. We've also got testing bubbles out beyond that. Um, we're still effectively testing the game in the CTE or using what data and using the uh, information we have available to try and make the highest quality game that we can. Because unfortunately, bugs can and do go through. But how we react to them is how we can make a higher quality product, even if it has already gone to player. And again, we can do that through data analytics. So another thing that my team does is we have uh, crash data. If your game crashes uh, in the world and you've consented to the upload, there is a 99.9% .9 chance that we have got the information about your crash. What crashed, why it crashed, what level you were on, what game mode you were playing, what gun you were using. Um, also uh, mini dumps and everything else uh, for that. And that, from that, we can extract information on where the hot points are. And that will allow, again, reducing a complexity, where dev and where QA can actually start focusing their effort. So the top graph here is, um, is a graph of the level game mode uh, distribution for crashes in Battlefield 1 uh, in the week of launch. 
uh, you can see quite obviously 50% of all of the crashes were in Conquest on uh, Desert at that launch, which is uh, not great. It was actually uh, out of memory crash, uh, that one. But because we realized that and because we had this data here and because, again, there's a huge amount of back-end systems we can control quite a lot of these things, we reduced the prevalence of uh, that uh, level and game mode in the server rotation. And then the next week, we saw that that was down to just 37%. Now, yeah, that's still way too much. And of course, the, all the developers and all the content creators were doing were just frantically just you know trying to fix that for the next bug. But that reduced the prevalence, and that actually increased the uh, stability that clients uh, experienced by about 10% doing that, which is um, it's highly valuable. And this was used as a use case for now why we do tracking and why we do monitoring and operations uh, on all of our live services so that we can tackle stuff like this. But overall, there's also some things that we can't test. As again, yeah, games are large, games are complex, and the games also rely on systems that we don't have access to or that we, uh, you know, we can't have the access uh, code for. These are things like uh, Sony and Microsoft's um, you know, uh, platform code or uh, uh, rendering, uh, rendering driver APIs. So what we do is we then use our testing systems and some of our technology uh, to mitigate that or work together to make a better product. And a really good example of this, and this is not a good picture for this room, but just that is a really beautiful picture <laughs> of the ray traced forest um, in, Battlefield, uh, in Battlefield 5. So for Battlefield 5, one of the, the major uh, like tech cha changes or like marketing beats that we did was we did a very strong partnership with NVIDIA uh, for their new ray tracing technology, which is uh, super cool crazy good rendering system that makes things a lot more realistic, a lot more realistic, um, you know, lighting, reflections, and so on and so forth. Um, we were the first title that was released with it, which was pretty cool. Uh, the problem was that, um, as with all new technologies, it wasn't as stable as we would have wanted it for launch. And for us to be able to debug this, we would have needed to have access to the uh, rendering driver code, which, of course, <coughs> uh, NVIDIA proprietary code, we we're going to have access to that. But what we were able to do with our AI bots and with our scaled testing systems, we were able to work with NVIDIA to provide them with basically a play test out of a box. They could boot up any level, any game mode, and just run in their debug builds, in their rendering farm, uh, a full multiplayer game, which would you know, be a lot better at making sure that it's in a good state and would have a much greater chance of reproducing any bugs that we would have. And because of this really strong partnership between us and NVIDIA, we managed to release this, and it actually went down quite well. As I understand. So this thing, we're not jealously guarding this technology. We want to make our games uh, as good as possible. And using partnerships and using technology like this enables us to do that. So, like I said, huge overview, very, very whirlwind thing there. But overall, just summarizing, making games is hard, really, really hard. There are very unique challenges. Um, and if you go, and I have actually asked this question before, like, do you want to have speed or do you want to have quality? The answer is invariably yes. But that's the thing. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. If you start being more intelligent about what you do, and if you start, you know, again, start putting part of the testing into your loop, into your, into your DevOps loop, you can achieve that. It requires teamwork. It requires sensible use of the resources available to you. We're not there yet. We're not yet at the two weeks, but we're well on the road to being there and getting both the speed and the quality that we need to be able to deliver that. And with that, thank you for listening. Are there any questions? How do you choose what tests to include in the pre-flight? OK, so the question was, how do we choose what tests to include in the pre-flight? Um, so what will typically happen is uh, during a development phase, there will, be, um, there will be probably a lead platform, there will be a game mode or a test, or just something that is being focused on, something that the vast majority of the studio would potentially care about, and that if that caused a problem, it would affect the most people. So typically, it would be, uh, is there a test available? What are we focusing on? What is the focus platform? And then it would be on that. You can't have like an hour's worth of tests in pre-flight because with 800 developers working, we both don't have enough hardware, even with our room of hundreds of machines, and you, know, you wouldn't have the iteration speed that you would need. But it's just what is the highest value given that short amount of time? Mark, did you want to expand on that? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a constant trade-off with pre-flight. Um, we, as you said, when the, the main challenge is that uh, we have hundreds of people trying to check in at the same time. And um, before we 
figured out how to manage say, our build infrastructure properly, we would maybe have a queue of up to 20 people just waiting to get their changes through. And th when that's always at the time when people are trying to move the fastest and nothing makes a game team less happy than waiting for stuff at a point like that. So um, yeah, we, we had to be, we had to be quite cautious and what we ended up doing was um, maybe we were scaling back and not perhaps building every single platform because it's quite common most bugs um, will not be platform specific um, so we we ended up not building every single platform or not testing every single platform because like 90 percent of the bugs wouldn't be you know on just one platform it would crack if, if especially for things like data builds if the data would fail to build in one place it would often fail to build for all of them so so we ended up going a bit leaner with those things but yeah it's very much it has to be in a broader sense it has to be driven by analytics you have to look at what's the thing that's most likely to break and try and test for that and then always be adjusting it uh, so when you do these uh, like scripted gameplay tests what kind of stuff uh, do the tests actually look for? Like, what do they uh, assert? OK, so the question was, uh, when we do um, uh, the, the data tests or the uh, in-game tests, uh, how do we actually determine a failure case for them? Uh, what do they look for? Uh, so there's many things that we could be looking for there. Um, the engine and actually the data as a whole has got a large amount of uh, asserts, both fatal and non-fatal, uh, within them, which we can analyze to uh, any given level that we want. Uh, of course, if the runtime crashes, uh, that's a very good failure case. Or again, it's within game logic. So let's just say, for example, there was a picture I had earlier of just uh, a vehicle with a box next to it. Now, I could, through the game logic, say, let's just say the test is, check that the vehicle can drive forward. So get in the vehicle and press the accelerator, and then trigger the success case when, it, um, you know, when that bounding box is triggered. Now, a failure case could be, for example, it does not achieve that within a certain time. Or you could have some bounded boxes around the outside saying, if the vehicle hits here before that one, that is a failure case. I mean, it really depends on, uh, it really depends on what you're testing. I suppose some other good examples would be, um, uh, we actually managed to find a bug once where um, like the pistol in, or like some of the blasters in Star Wars were able to take out the vehicles in a single shot because the, uh, yeah, yeah, because the uh, weapon values were actually uh, misbalanced between them. Now, because we had a test saying that it needed to take X amount of time to take that out, we were actually able to find that and uh, eliminate it before it got to the players. So, yeah, really contextual, but we have all of, the, um, all of the protections of the engine and all of the context of what's going on there and all of the availability of what the data has so we can effectively script it to be whatever we want. Yeah, it's... it's as you were saying, it, you, we need to set thresholds rather than it can't be a yes, no, um, because of the unpredictability of what might happen in any given um, render loop or, or simulation loop. So it's much more around setting thresholds for what we expect to happen in this you know, really complicated system. Um, because that way, if there is a little bit of a glitch, um, we don't tend to get everything go red, even if, if nothing's broken, like say if if we put too slightly too many VMs on the one host and everything ran a tiny bit slower, if, if that suddenly broke a bunch of our test cases, we'd waste a bunch of time trying to figure out why is everything slow? And in fact, maybe it wasn't, maybe it was some other external thing. Because although we try, we don't necessarily uh, operate a lot of these things in a, in a complete vacuum. They're, they're not uh, that combined with the, the not uh, deterministic reprodu reproducibility of this stuff means you have to have kind of uh, error bounds basically. Do you have an easy way of simulating network delays for things that are hard to do on a single machine? Uh, so the question was, do we have any way of simulating network delays or maybe some more like hardware-specific events? Yeah, for example. Uh, so yes, um, there's. I think typically, let's just go with network delays, which I think is a very good example. Uh, there's two ways that we've been able to do it. Uh, we can either do a within engine simulation, so it'll be doing things like uh, introducing artificial packet latency, dropping packets, and so on and so forth. Um, which has been okay. I don't think it's had been majorly taken off. Uh, but we also have um, actually you know, simulated network environments that we can use. So one thing that I uh, didn't show here, but um, one of our uh, QA analysts um, was doing a while ago, uh, she did some amazing work where she'd get two PCs or two consoles or anything else, and uh, she'd then put a very high power uh, network simulation hardware between the two then she could just do all the network simulations she wanted. But then the way she tested it was uh, hooking up a, uh, a GoPro 
uh, like a really high speed, like 240 FPS GoPro, um, and also uh, attaching some LEDs to the mice so you can see when you click them, and then just recording uh, the network simulations between them, and just like recording both screens at the same time. So then you could count the amount of frames uh, between one happening and the next happening, and you could check whether there was like too much uh, bad latency there, uh, checking that the actions actually happened, or even just very simply uh, checking that it actually worked and the runtime didn't crash, which are things there. Um, that now there's definitely ways that we need to automate that now because you know having humans counting frames is not the best way of doing this. Uh, but as a prototype, that was absolutely fantastic, and it did save us because we were doing this testing. Um, a change came in in one of the games. I can't remember which one it was. Um, which actually uh, doubled uh, the latency uh, for each of the things, which would have been catastrophic if it had actually gone out. But because we had this checking, we could test this, and that change got backed out. Uh, I was wondering with regards to the automated tests, uh, I can see how we can easily see if the tests run or if there are crashes, but are, is there any way to test for, say, graphical bugs or audio bugs? Like the audio being off or graphics being rendered incorrectly, but it looks off. So the question was, uh, it's very easy to determine logic bugs from an automated testing system, but how about the things which would typically require human input, so things like rendering bugs or audio bugs or something and so forth. Uh, so yes, the focus of these at the minute is pretty much on uh, like human reproducibility, but there has been some forays into the areas that you're looking at. Um, not hugely on the game team level, but the Frostbite uh, engine, definitely. So they will actually use a very, very similar, if not the same, uh, testing system for this. But because they are just making sure they need to test that the engine is working consistently from release to release, um, they've got a lot more, it's a much more rigid ecosystem which they can test these things. They will have some levels which will have to be set up with uh, rendering examples, so loads of different materials, shaders, and so on and so forth. And uh, they will then take a screenshot, and then they will compare that screenshot to a previous one. and. Uh, you know, check if there's been any sort of delta going on there. And if the delta has gone over like too much, um, then they will flag that, hey, you need to look at this. Because realistically, rendering should be deterministic. So that's something that they can look at. Audio, on the other hand, I do not believe there's been any real testing for that so far. Um, I know that there is, um, there have been tests written that check whether audio is actually triggered, but whether it actually comes out correctly, um, that is unfortunately still the, um, still the domain of humans, uh, as is art testing and so on and so forth. But that's not a bad thing. So, I mean, if you think about it, again, we've got these massively complex games. And, you know, we still do, and we can't test for fun. It doesn't matter how good, we're not going to come up with a unit test for fun. And if anyone here wants to prove me wrong on that one, I would love to talk to you after this. Humans still need to be in the loop. And what we would really rather have is having QN, having everyone else just focusing on destructive testing, old path testing, like what are testing, things that require humans to actually look at that. All of the stuff we've been focusing on here is stuff that actually can be determined by a machine that doesn't really need a human's input. I mean, do you, do you, would anyone want to just sit and come in for like two years and just test, yeah, the guns will still fire? No, we don't need to do that. So there are definitely things which humans would still be valuable for. Isn't yeah, on the, uh, on the, the, the game engine side, um, that does actually have a bunch of unit tests in which are more functional, and, and there's a lot of uh, screenshot testing in that, uh, in like the UI and the render layer. But, um, for those, we have to, to lock it down a lot more. And so we, on the PC side of things, we worry quite a lot about driver versions and so on. And some drivers are better behaved than others uh, at having the same result every time. So there's a bunch of thresholds in there that are, are different for different drivers. But uh, yeah, those, those ones, they, they have to be more on the, the very clear unit test side of things because the, it's really easy with screenshot tests to make the threshold so high that actually it becomes kind of meaningless or you get this thing where you've got a threshold and a change comes in which is technically wrong but it's not wrong enough and it doesn't it sits under the threshold and then the random noise that you were setting the threshold above to avoid before that comes along and, and just one running 20 will suddenly make the wrongness combined with the random noise oh now it's over the threshold and you end up having tests where you're like well these tests are really unreliable and then because of this combination of actually it's like the, these used to be reliable why are they now not reliable and it turns out that actually that was a rendering bug so the again it's about spending our time uh, as david said in the in the right place so so in some cases we've actually taken out some of those screenshot tests because they just it was too hard um with the constraints that we had on reliability to to make them uh useful uh things to spend our time on 
Yeah. Thank you. So um, I really like your point about humans, uh, the, the importance of humans and quality of humans. And I would formulate it as uh, humans are ex extremely good oracles, at, at extremely wide oracles. So they can detect a wide range of problems without having a, a, them explicitly stated in the first place. Uh, and on the contrary, like automated oracles are extremely, extremely narrow. They only focus on one thing. Um, so we, we do need humans, and how can we make sure that the, the jobs of, of human testers is not stupid and boring? How can we make sure that it's an empowering and, and interesting job? Cool. So the question was, um, well, of course, we need humans in the QA process, and uh, you know, humans have a wide focus on the game to be able to see all sorts of problems and all sorts of quality issues, whereas tests are kind of narrow. So how do we actually develop that thing, or how can we ensure that humans are not spending that boring time and they're actually spending their time doing valuable human-led work? That, right. And that is a very good question. And that is, I think, effectively what we're trying to do here. So the thing, I, I've been doing this, as I said, for about 11 years now. And what, uh, at least like my current focus, is is my team doesn't write tests. We don't. We can't do quality for someone else. Just in the same way that QA can't make a, qu a product quality, it has to be. It has to be done. It has to be a mindset, or it has to be a development thing, which everyone does. So what my team does is we try and make that as easy as possible. We try and make uh, our tools, our processes, and our workflows as fast and efficient as possible, so people can actually own their own quality, so people can you know, do their own automated tests. People can test all of those um, uh, quantitative things as easily as possible and as part of the development process so that other people don't have to do it. So once we get over a certain stage and the more and more of these tests that we've got, eventually there won't be a huge amount of stuff which you know, QA needs to go and check that the guns are working because it's all there, it's all part of the development process. And then, once you've got to that point, you can have QA focusing on destructive testing. Now, that's also that's just uh, focusing on the development side. One of the other things we're also doing that my team is helping with is we're trying to upskill, um, trying to expand and upskill the uh, job of QA. You know, just QA hasn't been for years just kids in seats playing games. It's uh, it's a highly skilled and a highly specialised uh, discipline now. Um, you've got things like data analytics skills. You know, having a look at the performance metrics. Um, you know, some of these scripts are even written by QA for their own QA testing. We've got uh, QA in other locations uh, writing their own tools and processes to uh, speed up their verification or speed up the uh, good example. Massive back-end system, huge amount of progression things. We've got QA in some of our outsourced locations in Romania actually writing their own tools to automatically set these progression. So if you're testing a 10 kill thing, you don't have to test 10 kills. You'll set it to 9, do 1 kill. You're just improving these things. That's where I see the job of QA and just testing in general going in the future. And I'm hoping that talks like this are things that are going to help build that up and entice more people to come into this amazingly interesting domain. Yeah, uh, you talked about AI, uh, your simple AI, but do you guys, are you looking into the more advanced, like open AI being able to beat humans? They should be able to be trained to find glitches as well. Uh, so the question was, um, if we're looking uh, beyond uh, simple AI into more like, uh, let's say, machine learning, open AIs, things that can beat humans uh, as an additional thing. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, the simple AI initiative was actually, uh, it's only a couple of years old, and it was started by one of our senior directors of engineering who heard about open AI and said, God, this is a really good idea. Let's see if we can do that. So we hired a very, very good AI engineer, uh, Jonas Gilberry, who was, um, uh, as I said, created this system. Um, and as I said, we just created this classical AI system. Now, we are looking at those things, but not necessarily our department. So there's a few, uh, there's a few groups within the company who I know are looking at machine learning and more uh, you know, experimental AI uh, systems. Um, even actually in Stockholm, we've got this group called SEED, which is the Search for Extraordinary Experiences Division, basically uh, Skunkworks R&D. And they've been working on machine learning stuff for uh, quite a while. Um, Actually, if you haven't seen uh, my previous uh, talk at the ICST from last year, where we talk about testing, uh, we've actually got an example of some of the machine learning agents we've been using for Battlefield in that, and I think uh, your lecturer can share, share that with you. Uh, but yeah, so we are looking at that. And that definitely has its purpose, but these, this AI, um, I don't think we actually really need them. So that's the thing, it's like if having 
having trained your networks to just come out and do destructive testing, yes. But in these cases, in these tests, you know, much like unit tests, they need to be as predictable as possible. So being able to actually script the behavior of what things do is actually highly valuable here. That said, however, I'm thinking in a few years' time, we can probably start looking at that. Sorry, very rambling answer. Yes and no. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so the like the whole pipeline that you described, that itself sounded extremely complex. Like how, how do you uh, make sure that that works when you update it? Like do you have a meta test pipeline for it or something? Yeah, well that, that's actually what I often describe this as a DevOps team because it, essentially that's our product and we're developing it and operating it is hugely important because that's where the value <laughs> to the company comes. But you're right, we're developing it all the time. Um, so there's um, what we're trying to do at the moment is uh, it used to be that a lot of our changes would uh, be tests in production because we'd be, uh, a game team would say, oh, we really need you to suddenly start building this level and we'd, we'd build it and then if it broke, oh no, we will fix it. Um, but uh, we've been able to introduce a lot more rigor in the, the last few years because we've been getting better at essentially taking that huge pipeline and um, if you treat it as a huge monolithic thing, you end up testing in production. But we're actually getting better at um, uh, architecturally dividing that up into different layers, um, which have a um, much clearer idea of uh, they're dealing with a particular uh, aspect of the system. Uh, and those, there's a very natural sort of isolation between those two layers. And that's giving us boundaries that we can start putting them into separate black boxes and actually having better defined APIs between them. So as an example, a lot of the logic uh, in DICE we used to run um, within our, our CI uh, system, which um, we currently use Jenkins. Other CI systems are available. We've used plenty of them in the past. And who knows if we'll stay on Jenkins in the future. I'm just making sure that I'm not endorsing Jenkins in any way for the legal people. So we currently use that. We used to run a lot of our logic as um, basically Groovy script within Jenkins. Um, but the testability of that, we had a lot of struggles with. Uh, and so we've, we've taken a bunch of the, what I call the execution layer out of that and put it into Python scripts instead. Because the Python scripts, we were able to use the existing uh, unit test and uh, code coverage tests that come with Python. Uh, and so by moving the logic out of this thing you needed to run on a server and into a thing that you can run on your machine with that really tight feedback loop, Again, we're always talking about feedback loops of, yeah, I'm going to run the test, and within a minute or two, I'm going to get back a, a unit test saying, yes, that was good, that was bad, or, oh, you've added some new code, and actually, you haven't added a test for it, so then you need to add that. That's really helped our reliability, and that's, um, that's something that we now use for all of the production at DICE is running on this, uh, this platform where we're trying to get more and more of it under your kind of classical code quality uh, metrics and split into different systems so that we can test them separately before we, we put them into production. But certain things you still need to, unfortunately, spin up a test server for. So uh, again, we're, we're going DevOps on that. And really, it's about uh, making sure that all of our production infrastructure is actually built in a repeatable way, and ideally with uh, no human hands having touched it at all. Uh, because then it's repeatable to the point where we can actually have these test instances that are, you know, automatically triggered as a, a commit comes into our uh, uh, to our our configuration uh, of this system, uh, and then we can run that through a series of of tests, including if we need to spinning up, you know, an automatically constructed environment and and running some acceptance tests on it. So, um, so we've we've got a lot better code coverage, I guess, than we used to have, um, but. I'm, I'm always pushing people to do more, so I'd, I'd like us to, to improve it. But it, it, we've definitely found a lot of benefits in terms of, uh, I guess, moving into the configuration as code uh, sense of doing this stuff rather than just jumping into a UI and making a test and hitting go. Sorry, making a change and hitting go and going, well, let's see if that works, which was, I guess, where we were a couple of years ago. But great question. Thank you. Oh, we've got a question online. OK, I'll, I'll read it to you. <laughs> David talked about QA's changing role, but mostly focused on the diagnosis slash finding issues. How do you see QA's role on the preventative side, e.g. risk assessment, etc.? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, so, 
So as a technical person, not hugely involved in that section, but uh, they're right. QA, QA, in my opinion, should be having a... Uh, it should be involved in quality at every single stage of the development process. Um, not just, you know, not just finding stuff after the fact, but also QA should be involved in like the feature planning, like the discussion. Oh, what if we did this? What if we, uh, what if we did X, Y, Z? Oh, yeah, that's worked well in uh, previous games, or you know, uh, that you know, the the customers might want that from feedback from uh, you know, analytics, Twitter, the the environment as a whole. But also thinking like, how are you going to test this? How scalable is this? And um, how how are you going to develop this feature so that it's something that we can actually grow into? Uh, you know, something we can actually grow into, whatever the fun will be. Having QA in those conversations, having QA being like part of these design discussions is absolutely something that, you know, if it isn't happening already, does need to happen in the future. And then, you know, part of the pipeline, you know, going even beyond launch, you know, you've got QA as part of the launch team, like uh, out in the world. Can they see industry changes um, or like industry trends coming that are, uh, you know, might affect the product of the future. Um, are they, uh, you know, can they, can they take feedback from like what's actually happened there and use that to uh, like feed the design? Um, can QA maybe be doing uh, like a pair programming, even pair development with some of the feature developers? I mean, these are all things that need to be there. I suppose it really just depends on how does your location work, how does your studio work, and then what are the what are the touch points of quality in which QA can help you grow? I mean, really there is no upper limit to this. We all want to make a good game, so how can we improve it? I hope that answered the question. It was a little bit fluffy. Anyone else? Uh, do you have any problems with uh, these unre unreliable tests, uh, like flaky tests, and how do you mitigate them in that case? So the question was, do we have any, any problem with uh, flaky tests, and how do we mitigate their problems? Uh, yes, we do have problems with flaky tests. Um, I mean, the yeah. fact that we're on a non-deterministic system is probably the biggest issue that we have to face right now, and we don't really have a good answer to that one right now. It's just a case of, or at least the way we typically try and address it is um, we try and remove as many environmental factors as we can. So all of our tests will run on machines of the same specifications, for example, from VMs of the same specif specifications. We try to make sure that the uh, backend systems or environment are set up as much as possible. We try and set up our tests in completely isolated levels so that nothing else is loaded. You're not going to have a random plane just crashing into your vehicle and ruining your vehicle test. Try and remove as many external factors as possible. And as Mark said, just create the threshold for success loose enough that it can deal with reasonable changes, but tight enough that it will actually detect something. Mm. And then when we get to that stage, once it's gone green, try and keep it there. Now, if it's perpetually flipping and it's not actually having any stability, then it's not having any value. And eventually, we just call a time on those tests and we find some other way of doing it. We can't win them all, but we can win the majority of them. There's a lot, uh, look, again, it's a lot of data analytics yeah. involved. And, and the better ones are ones where it's actually not it, although we always have to have a yes, no answer, ones where there's like a metric coming into it, uh, we're getting better now at saving that uh, kind of record of how that metric has changed over time, because hopefully then we'll detect that case of uh, actually the the, 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 the faulty check-in happened earlier, but just this time that the error metric has, has pushed it above some threshold, because you'll see kind of the average of that line suddenly change from being, oh, it was was around this line and up and down, but now it's at this point it sort of changed to be it's a, it's a, the average has moved up and that's where the problem was, um, and uh, you know we might even find over time that potentially we would uh, aggregate multiple test runs again and do like an average rather than um, so we'd be we'd be doing a statistical st a statistical test rather than testing a particular run might be the way that we could do it, especially where we're doing things at scale. But yeah, it's still it's still difficult. <laughs> and a lot of it comes down to gut as well. It's, some of it comes down to like, what is the thing actually testing? Uh, because if it's if it's not testing something important, then the likelihood of, is this just generating more work than, than the thing that it's trying to guard against? Again, that's where you'd go, well, no, let's just throw it out. Sometimes there's an element of, there's so much complexity here. <laughs> Sometimes we can simplify by throwing things away if they're not adding value. Very good. It seems there is no more questions. Um. So first of all, thank you very much.
really enjoyable. Thank you very much for coming to KDH. Uh, thank you for coming to this very last lecture in real life. Uh, thank you for those who are on the web. Uh, it was a premiere, you know, it has uh, like a stream guest lecture in this uh, KDH DevOps course. Uh, there will be another one next year. Um, so thank you everybody. Thank you Mark, David for coming today, for taking this time. It was very valuable. The students learned a lot. We learned a lot. Uh, so, so thank you, thank you everybody. Bye bye, and see you later. Bye bye.